Good evening, everyone. My name is Thane Rosenbaum. I'm the creative director of the Forum on Life, Culture, and Society at Turo College. And welcome to the Folks Conversation Series. Tonight's guest, Jay Newman, and his first novel, Under Money. This is a fabulous read. It is a financial and political thriller for the mind and of the moment. Uh, it's filled with incredible cultural references that will teach you a lot about what's been happening in our world in a very entertaining and, and, and exciting way. Uh, Vladimir Putin makes a cameo appearance, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman from, uh, from uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, there's references, of course, to hedge funds and the Met Gala and yachts uh, and drone strikes everything you ever really wanted to know about anything that's in the dark, whether it's the deep state or dark money or the dark web. These are terms of art that everyone hears about but really doesn't understand. You wanna know how to understand it? Read this. Uh, Under Money is uh, set to be published, I think on Tuesday, it's his official pub date. So we're excited to have Jay Newman here. This is in fact his first novel. He is a, how do I describe this? Uh, well, I would say he's a Wall Street legend and a financial wizard. How's that? Uh, he'd spent 40 years in the finance industry specializing in sovereign debt and distressed debt in uh, countries such as Latin America, uh, Eastern Europe, uh, Africa, I think Asia as well. He, I think became famous uh, for helping to recover uh, $2.4 billion from Argentina in, in a sovereign debt uh, recovery. Uh, and many people remember him from that. Uh, and of course, he's also had his own hedge fund uh, for many years. And we're gonna talk about that because in fact, one of the central characters in the novel, uh, Elias Vicker is in fact a hedge fund. Uh, I would say he's a psychopathic hedge fund uh, director, but, but we'll discuss that uh, as, we, as we move on. Um, if you're watching us live on YouTube, welcome. Welcome, we always enjoy having you. Uh, sign up uh, to, uh, for our channel uh, on YouTube, and don't forget to come to folks.org and sign up for our email so you'll get regular uh, uh, information about our upcoming events. Um, you know, before we meet Jay, I just want to say, you know, we've had uh, Oliver Stone here many years ago uh, to discuss Wall Street, and we had Tom Wolf here uh, many years ago uh, to discuss the bonfire of the vanities. And so I want to say that I like to think of Jay Newman as a sort of the, as a trifecta, that these are three very specific events that folks has done over the years uh, with three very special guests and three very special works of art. And so with, with that introduction, Jay, welcome to folks. Well, I Thane, thank you so much for having me. It's uh, I'm, I'm honored and I'm awed and I'm a little scared. <laughs> uh, but you know, you'll uh, you'll put me at ease, I'm sure. But... I will, and let me tell you how I'll start with that because I'm scared. Let me tell you why I'm scared. I'm scared because this book <laughs> is so not just entertaining but revealing that I'm worried. Is there a hit on you? Is there something that you might say here tonight that would endanger your life or your family's life? I don't want to be responsible for that because this book is, is really in some ways an entertaining tell-all and, and a, a revelation about sort of the intricacies of high, high level finance and market manipulation that most people, it's just too opaque. And you in a very entertaining way opened up the windows and the doors and let some air into something that is usually not known. And so while answering that question, Tell us about the title, uh, Under Money. Is it a term of art? What does it mean? What's its relationship to dark money? So under, under money, um, <clears throat> I'll just describe where, where it actually came from. Um, uh, uh, one, of my, one of my sons, uh, David, was studying in Japan. And he uh, befriended a restaurateur, a guy who he still has a restaurant there, Asano, uh, Asawa Asano has a restaurant, um, Robotaya in Ropangi. And Asao came to New York uh, and he was visiting and we took him out to eat uh, because he was thinking about opening a restaurant in New York. Uh, and I asked him whether there was a difference between opening a restaurant in New York and in uh, Tokyo. And he 
looked up and he rubbed his fingers together in the universal sign of money. And then he put them under the table and he said, no, under <laughs> money. Oh, wow. So under money is actually um, Japanese slang for corruption, petty corruption, um, which um, I, I've defined in the, in the book as um, the, uh, the, you know, I, I can never get this um, actual definition straight, so I'm just going to read it because it's... Um, well, at one point, I think you simply say that it's unknown to the public it's and unknown, it has the potential to control people, right? Unknown publicly, and the real, the real critical point is it controls people and events. Yeah. And, uh, so in the case of a restaurant, maybe the, maybe the under money controls an inspector, maybe it controls a partner, who knows who it controls, but the, the point of under money is that there are these rivers of money coursing uh, below the surface all around us. Uh, and they, they sometimes rise to the surface, they sometimes uh, you know, dive back down to their caverns, sometimes they erode the land and people sink into it, but always, 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 it's the money. And if there's one thing that I'm hoping that um, uh, the book Under Money accomplishes, it's to get people to think anytime something doesn't make sense, hmm. it's probably because there's under money involved. Hmm. And even if it does make sense, there's under money involved. No, in fact, I would say the novel is so, for, especially for people that believe in conspiracy the the uh, theories, it makes you realize can that possibly have been a coincidence, right? How, did, how do you really think that all that happened just without anybody instigating it, without any even little push? And I'll, I'll go one up on you on this one, Jay. I would say that Under Money, the way you describe it, it's more, it's more exciting in the novel the way than normally graft. I would call it like high tech graft, right? That it's, it's graft on crack, you know, because it just isn't just a suitcase of money being pushed along the table, like, you know, ab scam or, you know, the things that we remember of these corruptions in our world and politics. This is way more sophisticated. This is way darker and deeper because it, it's done with computers and it's done in with, you know, drone strikes, right? In the kind of things that graft, 19th century graft could never have imagined. In fact, I would suggest even the year 2000 graft couldn't do this, right? That there's something about, that's what I meant of, of the moment and, that makes this different. I think that's a, that's a very important point because it's, um, the, the characters, this is the worst kind of, of uh, I mean, there is, you could say there is benign under money. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, you know, it's, you know, small amounts to buy a little favor here and there, but this is money on a, an international scale. And these are people who make events happen. And to your point about it being of this moment and of this time, they make things happen so they can actually trade in financial markets on the events. Uh, and they're, they're willing to do um, whatever it takes to make money. Uh, and that, you know, as you can imagine, um, involves destroying property and destroying people. Well, we're going to get to that later because I want to bring up later the Oliver Stone night, because to give it some context with the Jay Newman night. Why don't you um, just, the novel is so exciting, I'm afraid to give too much of the plot away. Uh, and, and we don't normally do that anyway, but tonight I definitely don't want to do that because I want people to buy this and to be excited and startled by things. So let me just say, can you just briefly set up the plot and then I'll move us from there. Just get us through that. So the, the, the plot is driven by a group of uh, patriots. Um, uh, most of them are soldiers. Um, one, the female protagonist, Greta Webb, is, uh, is a CIA agent. Uh, and this small group of people simply doesn't like the way the world is being run, the way the country is being run, and the way the military is being run. And they decide that they might be able to do something about it if they can get one of their member elected to higher office. And they, they have, uh, you know, they, they, they aim high. Uh, and what they realize early on is that what they need to get uh, anyone elected to anything is they need a lot of money. 
so that involves uh, an event that happens at the very beginning of the book that I won't describe. Maybe you will, Thane, but uh, that you know they they grab a bunch of money. The money actually becomes a character. Yeah. Uh, and that you know that. Uh, By the way, Jay, is it merely a coincidence that it's the same number that you recovered from Argentina? <laughs> Am I the only one who figured that thing out? <laughs> that, that the number two point four billion has a lot of resonance in the Newman family. <laughs> well played. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go ahead. Sorry, I just I was just showing off. Okay, go ahead. So they um, they decide that um, they need a lot of money, and they they stumble upon a uh, hedge fund, and they decide that a hedge fund is the perfect vehicle to. Uh, manage their money to make more money, uh, and also as a front for their activities, uh, which is, you know, in, in, in kind of national security circles, fronts have always been very, very important. So a hedge fund is a perfect vehicle. What they, what they don't realize when they first uh, get involved with this hedge fund is how intensely corrupt uh, it is. Well, and that's, and that's the framework. And that's the framework, but it also includes the use of money uh, in, 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 to influence politics, to maybe even get someone elected in politics. Uh, it really gives you the sense of how funding can be misdirected. And I, I think what's interesting about this is that when we, we had John Dean as a guest a couple of years ago, we were talking about Watergate and he told this anecdote about how he was with the president in the Oval Office. And he, the president said something like, uh, well, how much is it gonna cost us? use like direct words, it was eventually on the Watergate tapes. What would it cost us to bribe these people? And he said, well, we would, John Dean says, we, we would need a million dollars in cash. By the way, uh, Jay, this is when a million dollars was a million dollars. <laughs> because I know you're thinking, what? <laughs> yeah, that's what it, in 1972, that's that what was we, real, That was real money. That was serious money. So John Dean says on the audience and folks, he says, so I turned to the president. And he said, I don't know where I would get that. And, and the president apparently says to John Dean, well, I can get it for you right now. It's here, like that it's in the White House someplace and he has access to that. And like that, that's like, you know, that's the kind of thing that the, you know, the Watergate committee needed to hear that, you know, was, that was what it was all about, that the president not only knew about it, but he knew where the money was. <laughs> so what, what, what's interesting here is that that's old school use of politics and money. What you introduce here is, how do you get real money? And, the, and it's, that is not necessarily in the safe of a White House or it's in a, in a, in, in a, under a bed or in a briefcase. But if you manipulate the markets, you can get huge amounts of money. You can fund anything you'd ever want to fund without actually building your own equity, simply by market manipulation. That is something that's new that we had, I don't think has appeared in many other books or any film. Uh, that it's not just money, it's the manipulation of world financial markets that actually essentially generates the mo money to do all the evil deeds that you're describing. It's worse than just, you know, handing over a briefcase. It's when you say that the four protagonists don't realize what's really going on in the hedge fund, they don't realize that the way in which the, what you said earlier is, if something bad happens, you should probably assume there's some under money, right? And what they realize, they don't realize patriots that in fact, that's exactly what's happening. That the hedge fund is not only investing in disaster, it's creating disaster. And I think that that is a new concept. So now that I, now that I raised that out of the novel, you were a hedge fund guy for 40 years. Is this something that we should really be thinking? Because what you said before is fascinating. You said, if something happens, you should always imagine that there's under money. You weren't kidding, right? That, that in fact, some of these, it's not just to make money, it's to make money and to do evil deeds that, right, that makes this novel very different and what makes this a different type of political thriller in merging high finance and politics. The, um, so I'm gonna step back for just a second because when I, when I retired from day-to-day -day hedge fund work, I thought about writing about my, my career and what I did and I realized that would just be a snooze. Uh, so I started thinking about the kind of different, different elements of things I had done over the, over the years, people I had met and things that I had observed 
because hedge funds are basically, uh, they're very powerful, but they're also very boring. And most of them are completely honest, but it's the ones that aren't honest that are interesting to us all. So the Alan Stanford's, the um, uh, the one MDB scandal, the um, uh, uh, you know the uh, Bernie Madoff. I mean, so it's the bad guys and the guys that you know, they go over the line. Uh, in this case, to uh, actually make events happen that are horrendous in order to trade on them that are interesting. And the people with the most power, and one of the, I don't think it's giving away too much to say that one of the Yeah, let's, yeah. One of, the, one of the main characters here is a guy who is um, a, a Russian who is- This is, a, this is Volk. This is Fyodor Volk, who, yeah. own, who, who owns a private military company, uh, which is a basically a mercenary army that is involved not just in kinetic activity, like blowing stuff up, but he's involved in blowing stuff up and, and trading on it. And, the, and as I started thinking about that as a model for the characters and for the, the plot line, I realized that this has to be happening all the time. And mm. this, you know, if I'm, you know, maybe this is what gets me on somebody's list, um, but uh, let's have <laughs> go at it. Um, you'll, you'll never be able to convince me that when uh, you know the when OPEC, which is mm. the the cartel that that mm. uh, uh, manipulates oil prices, get together and set production quotas, and they have these kind of false they have these fights, public fights about whether Saudi Arabia increases production or yeah. decreases production or Venezuela or Russia or how mm. they you know kind of play on the on the world stage. You'll never convince me that they're not actually at the same time trading on the market impact of those public conversations. Uh, and I think that it, it's this, the, if you imagine every single geopolitical event, even including, let's just stay, you know, stay completely current, how is Vladimir Putin trading on his threat against the Ukraine? Wow. Right? You're, saying, you're saying there's a trade to be made there. I'm saying there's a trade. Wow. Uh, Creating, creating that uncertainty, and then at a certain point, either accelerating the uncertainty uh, through some sort of a, you know, a, a military campaign, or simply pulling back. Or, by the way, it could also be done in a more a sin, a sinister, but not as uh, aggressive. For instance, uh, Parsifal, Volk, could be uh, deployed for that purpose, right? Mm -hmm. The novel introduces the idea that you don't even have to actually go to war to make this happen. You can hire privately people to figure out a way to instigate the conflict, and now you're in business. And, in, and, and, and you're in a big business, and it's a big business that, that mm -hmm. uh, every, every country has its, uh, its mercenaries. Uh, it's, it's uh, you know, the, the US has them. We, we read in, in when the US left Afghanistan, it wasn't just, uh, uh, troops that had to be taken out, but it was, it was contractors, contractors yeah. being a code right. word for, uh, for a mercenary force. Uh, the people that, you know, maybe they carry guns, maybe they don't, in a lot of cases they do, but they're certainly driving trucks and, and um, moving fuel around and flying people around. And, uh, you know, it's an it's a enormous business. So, you know, it's funny, when I was reading the novel, I was thinking you know, you keep introducing Putin and I keep thinking, of course, right? This is a former KGB agent, right? I mean, he's perfect for the kinds of what you're saying, the kind of manipulation. So that like, for instance, we were introduced, and this is, I guess, my next question anyway, which is so much of this, what became of the moment was the Trump election, because the Trump election sort of introduced words like disinformation campaigns, misinformation campaigns, Russian meddling. Think about those terms of art that are now, you know, every, every cab driver, everyone who works in a gym, everyone knows these terms of art. The, these things are part of us now, but it all started in 2016, right? And so the novel sort of picks up on all these terms of art, the deep state, the dark web, the dark money, in this case, the under money, these things that are, are, are sinister, that manipulate uh, world events, but that, again, that's why I said before how much it's dependent on high technology, right? It's like a merger of a number of things. 
and that the, the meddling of the 2016 meddling through social media, I think, I don't know whether people, that's why I think this, this novel is so urgent and necessary as well as entertaining because we've now become inured to the idea that, that a country can interfere with our election. But Jay Newman goes, are you kidding? That's nothing. <laughs> we could, you have no idea what this is. And you buy, forget social media. You don't even need to use social media. There are other things that one can do through market manipulation that are much more powerful, right, Jay? Much more powerful and much more destructive uh, because it really um, hits, hits people at home. It hits their, it hits their pensions, it hits their paychecks. Uh, it's, um, and uh, there's an endless palette of things that um, a, uh, a malefactor could actually do because it's, um, uh, if, you're, if, you've got, if you've got the willingness to actually blow things up, you can blow anything up anywhere, anytime. And one of, one of the things that I explore that, um, and I think this is, I mean, I'm, now this is, this is fiction, but um, let's say we believe this. The, the ability of bad actors to get themselves into any country, but particularly into our country, and to have a go at what's going on here, uh, whether it's on the streets, whether it's on our computer terminals, mm -hmm. uh, I'm just gonna, you know, just throw one out there. Um, all these, you know, little plugs that, you know, are made abroad. What if they have listening devices in them? Hmm. You know, and we have no choice but to buy them. It's um, uh, there. It's it, it's an, the the range of possibilities are, you know, are un, are are endless. Uh, and again, a, technology makes that possible. There's another example of a kind of high stakes graft that has it, it is fully dependent on wiring or wireless. Um, so let's go back to the hedge funds for a moment because what you said, um, because I think it raises an interesting idea that gets into the core of the novel, the concept of the, the normal accidents, which I'll have you explain in a second. But I think in order to understand this and to also think about um, market manipulation, I'm not sure, you know, our audience is super sophisticated at folks, but sometimes there's some certain things that people don't know. So for instance, you were a hedge fund person for many, many years. The difference between a hedge fund and a mutual fund is significant. And it's what makes it possible for hedge fund guys and women, I don't know how many women are actually at the heads of these hedge funds to have this just shocking amounts of money um, and some of it, right? So explain the concept of short selling because that's really in some ways the heart of the, 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 the core of what makes this novel not just so, not only exciting because it introduces us to the, the world of absolute luxury, right? Okay, that's true. It's a sexy novel, I got it. But in addition to it, it's where the danger really comes from because it's where the real, the, the, the critical mass of money can be generated that money managers ordinarily would not even be able to do without this regulatory assistance. It, 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 well, exactly. So it's it's um, to make to make money honestly is a is a grueling. <laughs> it's a tough it's a tough business, right? A lot of people are very good at it and and are very successful. Wait, you said no, no. I'm sorry, said you said not many people are very good at. It. Is that what you said? No, no. It's not 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 many not many people are really good at it right? to do it honestly. To do it honestly, and and most most of the most of the U.S. financial industry is completely is completely honest. And by the way, more and more women are running hedge funds, so it's mm -hmm. it's a uh, it's um, it's no longer just a, a boys' mm -hmm. club. Um, but the but the to to address your question about shorts, it's my point about making money is if you're if you're making money in investing, you're basically finding things that you think are going to go up. But what the characters in Under Money do is they make things go down, because it's um, it's very it's very unpredictable. The the fat the the so-called fat tail the event that we don't think is going to happen that when it happens is extremely profitable. If you knew that you know the the, the stock of uh, a particular company was going to go from you know a hundred to zero because the company's main business was being destroyed. That is something that you can trade on by being short uh, the stock, which is another way of saying uh, you are betting, you're, you're placing a financial bet that is gonna go down. 
Uh, and it's, um, it's much easier in a sense, if you have the willingness to destroy things than it is to you know, do the research and find a, you know, a great company or a great uh, molecule or a great business and, and make money because it's gonna do well and it's gonna go up. Oh, well, okay, go ahead. I, I was gonna ask you to like, for instance, the reason I wanna jump in right now is because this I think first was introduced, I could be wrong, and you were definitely in Wall Street at the time, at, at 9-11 because it did seem that there was some criticism that hedge fund guys, in those days it really was guys, it was a boys club, were taking advantage of the World Trade Center and Pentagon strike, and they were betting against the country. And it just seemed as if when we're being told about freedom fries <laughs> and patriotism was at its, you know, everyone was thinking about how can we be patriotic? People who were playing NFL football were retiring and going to, into the you know, Texas Ranger School. There was a whole sense of pro-America. And then there was the Wall Street guys that could figure out a way to make money off of the disaster, right? Is that, is that an example of what you're talking about? And I'm also wondering, we also know from 2008, we learned that there's new billionaires that were created by people that, right? I think that's the, the it was made into a movie, The Big Short, right? That shorting the market, knowing that the mortgage, uh, mortgage backed securities crisis had just destroyed the real estate industry and destroyed investment banks all over Wall Street. And uh, uh, an honest uh, person <laughs> who's trying to bet on the market is not in a good position, but a hedge fund was in a good position and you could have bet against the American real estate market and end up a billionaire. And, and people, but people bet both, both ways. Um, and some people were betting on the, you know, betting that the real estate market would go up and until 2008 were making fortunes that way, not, not really taking into account that the entire system was, was, uh, was very weak. So people make money both ways and being short is not being dishonest, but making an event happen, blowing up a building or blowing up a factory in order to profit on from, from the event uh, is dishonest. And the, but 9-11 is, uh, you know, there are lots, so many conspiracies surrounding it, uh, particularly the, uh, the role of Saudi Arabia in that, you know, the, uh, the maybe perhaps apocryphal story that, that uh, right after 9-11, uh, you know, hundreds of Saudis were allowed to leave the country at a time when, uh, you know, airports were shut down. Uh, did that happen? I'll bet that that happened. But and also, I think what is implicit in there is that we learned immediately thereafter that the vast majority of the 9-11 uh, uh, terrorists, in fact, were Saudis. Right, and it presented a, a, a very uncomfortable situation for people who are doing business with the royal family. Now, again, I don't know whether people like you thought, yeah, and the royal family also had relationships with you know, Osama bin Laden. I mean, that's, we were told that's not true, but that there was a difference between the Saudis that were on the plane and the Saudis that got out early, what you're describing, right? The Saudis that said, you know, I'm in the royal family. I'm now my I'm I'm a student somewhere. I'm getting the hell out of here because I don't want to be a Saudi in the United States on 912, 913, 1914, 915, because there's going to be hell to pay. And I don't want to tell people I'm a Saudi, right? So I'm wondering whether you're saying even at that time, that idea had an under under money potential. So this you 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 just made me I hadn't thought about this before, but let's just take the case of uh, Osama bin Laden, bin Laden. Mm -hmm. Um, family was in business. They were in construction, right? In construction. And so he goes into deconstruction. So he knows he's <laughs> gonna, <laughs> he knows he's, it's, it's horrible, right? Um, it's a horrible, it's a, it's a bad joke, but it's funny. All right, uh, go ahead. So, but, so they know, they know business and what do they know? They know that, uh, they know which planes they're going to hijack. They know they're going to take these planes down. They know that planes are owned by airlines. Uh, they know that that airlines and tourism are a big industry. They know that um, you know if they take down the the um, a, a a building at the center of Wall Street, it's going to affect Wall Street. It's going to affect stocks. It's going to affect bonds. 
Um, You're saying that the bin Laden family, which was already rich, could have been made richer if they knew in advance what their son or nephew was going to do. Vastly, vastly, vastly richer. Yes. And do we have evidence? Is there any? I mean, this is so fascinating. It's worth its own book. Is there any evidence that that's even possible? Because I hadn't thought about it until you just said it, that bin Laden came from a wealthy family and he essentially had inside information. <laughs> he, he, was, he had inside information that would technically in America, the SEC would be, you know, if there was such a news that someone would know that now you can bet against hotels and Wall Street because this country is gonna be in a met and in, on 9-11, it's going to take them a long time to recover. Yeah, uh, and airlines. And uh, could it have happened? Absolutely, it could have happened. And by the way, the novel, what you told us at the beginning, and the novel itself, sensitizes us to this reality. And I think that that's a very good takeaway from tonight's talk and from the reading of the novel, that spend a moment thinking about who could make money off of this. And it's but classically under money. Right, right. So you're saying, Thane, what you said about hedge fund short selling is harsh because that is legal. And maybe people think it's, uh, it's unpatriotic, but it's perfectly legal to bet against the market. It's, it's certainly if you don't have inside information or worse, if you don't have what you describe in the book as normal accidents. Although I would argue that the, what, what you describe in the novel is not a normal accident it's a manufactured accident, right? And, and so explain that, explain that when you said earlier, this gives you a better chance, another chance to explain why the four patriots don't even realize who they've invested with. Because in fact, this hedge fund is really in the business of these accidents, not just selling short, but selling shorts on uh, events that they create. So there's a, there's a um, one of the most influential um, for me, an influential book was a book called Normal Accidents um, by a guy named Charles Perot, who was a Yale um, sociologist. And he basically described the, uh, how complex system, how systems become more and more and more complex until they, they naturally fail. I mean, a, a, you know, a perfect recent example is Surfside uh, condominium collapse. Right. right. A complicated system. People didn't really understand it. They didn't understand how to maintain it. The, you know, dripping, dripping, dripping water over a long period of time took down a building. Horrible. Um, so the the cover that this hedge fund in the in under money uh, uses is to profit from normal accidents, things that are kind of natural failures. Um, the difference the difference being that you know he knows when those natural failures are going to occur. Uh, and mostly he knows they're going to occur in the financial system. So he knows, for example, when uh, a particular central bank is going to devalue or revalue a currency. He knows when a, uh, a, a particular company is going to be selling a stock of gold. He knows all these things in advance because he has all these tentacles out through, um, you know, a, one of the characters, um, Lorenzo Gonzaga, who is an international man of, of fixing things and just knows everybody everywhere all the time. So all this information is flowing in and a lot of it relates to things that you might think, oh, just a normal accident, something that, you know, that broke that, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but what we don't think about is that um, maybe it wasn't so normal and maybe it wasn't uh, uh, innocent. So, so I'm sorry to get so conspiratorial here. Can we think of, of the coronavirus in terms of a normal accident? Uh, now, again, remember, I'm, 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 I'm not a finance person, so I, I'm, all I know is what I read from the novel. This is different from saying a person would have um, uh, uh, invested in Zoom in advance, right? Or, or Clorox, right? Or N95 masks. What the novels, the, the sinister dimension of the novel is to say, no, you invest, you sell short on airlines, hotels, and restaurants, because you, you know no one will be able to go in a hotel. The tour cruise ships, forget it. Like that, that if you could know, you know, if you, if you believe in those people who believe that the 
the virus was manufactured and released intentionally from the Wuhan lab, there is that is under money. That's a perfect example of what this novel's talking about, right? It's a perfect example. Uh, and so the if you were in the in the uh, so a lot to unpack in what you just um, suggested. The, the, on the first level, um, is is it was it biological warfare? Hmm. I'm a little skeptical of that. Uh, is is it reasonable to think that many many countries are um, engaged in uh, in researching microbes and and viruses with the idea they might deploy them uh, as a weapon? I think that's undoubtedly true. Uh, did you know was that happening with gain of function research uh, in Wuhan and it and it escaped? Maybe yes, maybe no. Maybe we're never going to find out. Um, but the but the the broader point is, and and we see this with um, with the Syrians, uh, which which I think the you know with Bellingcat revealed with their crowdsourcing, which yeah. is that um, Syria was engaged in um, biological warfare, right, in on, against its own citizens, but mm -hmm. you know uh, uh, Bashar al-Assad. Um, so it's um, does it does it happen? And if you put it together. Um, does it make for, you know, under money and profits from that sort of activity and that sort of warfare? Absolutely. Um, and again, you can see the complexity of, again, when we talked about not graft, but high, high tech graft, right? This requires, again, this is, this is, this is in, on the level of drone strikes. This is manufacturing a virus in a lab right? This is not just a suitcase of money being pushed across a table. This is, th this, this is a, a, a game of chess that requires a lot of advanced moves to get to checkmate. Yeah. To your, I, I'd like to ex explore one other aspect of um, uh, the, the, COVID, um, the, the COVID pandemic, which is, you know, we recently had a Fed governor resign, uh, at least in part because he sold stocks at the very, very beginning of the uh, of the pandemic, when the Fed knew perhaps what it was going to do, certainly there were deliberations, and you know, and immediately after he uh, sold his stocks, stocks declined, right? Classic under money. Wow. The and the other the other event in the same in a similar. Oh, wait event. one second, just to clarify for the audience, the under money is that. He did it, or is it that people like Wall Street people would see what he did, right, and then act on that, or is it both? Are both of those things happen? It's, it's more that these things these things happen and they're unseen. Uh, I see. And, and maybe that's not the perfect example of under money because it doesn't control uh, people and events, but it's right. certainly you know money that's flowing uh, under the surface that you know we don't we don't know why it's moving, we just know after the fact that it moved. Another another example: the um, the Wall Street Journal had a uh, an expose in the last few months. Uh, 131 federal judges. Federal judges are not supposed to own stock in entities that are litigating uh, in their courts. This was this expose showed that 131 federal judges did in fact. Hmm own shares in companies that were in front of them as litigants. Is that under money? I kind of yeah. think it's under money. It is. But so then let me ask you this, especially after reading this novel and watching this conversation with Jay Newman, you think to yourself, you mean to tell me there's no one in the New York Times or the Washington Post or at a you know, New Yorker that isn't saying to himself or herself, you know, that there's a, there are stories in these. I mean, there are stories so that these things benefit because of what you said. The key word is not known to the public. The key, that, the key thing is that it's not known, um, which is why it's called dark, right? That's what it means by deep or dark. It means it's being manipulated below the surface where we could see it. Are, why? Are you surprised that this shows up only in a novel, but doesn't show up in Pulitzer Prize winning pieces that are investigative? Or you're saying, Thane, this stuff is so dark that this is beyond the capacity of a New York Times reporter 
to actually connect these dots? I think we're starting to, we're starting to see um, those dots being connected. I think with the, um, the Panama Papers, the Pandora Papers, mm. the, the, these dumps of data that are being mined uh, and I think uh, are being uh, uh, then analyzed brilliantly by, by journalists. Um, uh, and I think we're seeing more and more of that. And I think that uh, if, people, uh, if people find ways to put that kind of you know, massive amount of information into the, and this is the case of, Thane, of, of maybe technology uh, works on both sides because the, the, the data that you need to ferret out the under money is uh, enormous, but you also need enormous processing power to figure out what's in the data. Right. So it's hard to extract that signal. And that, that again is a high tech problem, right? Mm -hmm. That's another thing like how to de decode the information. Yeah, it's high tech and it's, uh, and it's very expensive because computing power is very expensive. But I think we're starting to see that work being done. But the, the, the problem is there's just so much of it out there. There's every, every time you look at something and you think, what's going on here? The answer is usually money, yeah. Uh, especially when it, especially in the realm of politics. So uh, the novel is so entertaining in many ways. There's cultural references. The Met Gala is in there. High fashion is, you know, these incredible wild parties at expense, lavish hotels. You know, private jets. Um, you know, uh, wineries in France that have tunnels underneath them. Uh, just an endless stream of like what people can do to conceal money. And one of the things that I was fascinated by was this disclosure of Freeport airports. Can you tell the audience, this just, I'm sorry, there are very few things that I say are mind blowing. To me, this makes like having a platinum card for the American Express Lounge look like a joke. So tell us what, I mean, I'm never gonna then tell people that I have access to the American Express Lounge because I didn't know there was something called a free port. Tell the audience. So free, free ports um, uh, uh, began as ways to uh, uh, as ways to enable people to uh, engage in manufacturing activity uh, in way, without uh, without uh, incurring taxes. So let's just say the 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 biggest free port in the world is Mexico. Uh, money, you know, there and factories that produce, you know, cars and, and motors and other machinery often have entrances on both sides of the Mexican American border. Hmm. So the free port means that you can move parts in from the US into Mexico and build something in Mexico and then move it back and you don't pay taxes both ways. You know, obviously, you pay taxes when you sell your product, but the free port means there are no customs duties associated with moving of that product. But in, you know, in our current day and age, there are hundreds of free ports all around the world. Uh, and some of the biggest are in tax haven jurisdictions like Switzerland and Singapore. Uh, and, uh, uh, but there are 200 in the US. And my favorite free port is actually a free port in Switzerland where you can fly in, pull up to the free port and go inside a building that is really like a like uh, Madison Avenue you know, <laughs> under, you know, under a tent. Uh, and uh, with, you know, uh, with individuals can have their own vaults, including, uh, you know, art dealers and uh, arms. So you, you can hide things in that. You can hide things. You can Im imagine a- And there's no, there's no custom agent that's there for this purpose, right? Uh, no, there is no customs agent. <laughs> And once you're in there, then you can trade amongst yourselves. So if you want to, if you want to, you know, trade a gold bar for a work of art, or you want to trade, um, you know, a, a suitcase full of cash for uh, some, you know, anti-tank weapons, it's all there, and it's all been flown in anonymously, uh, and is there for the uh, for the. And bidding. is anyone? Um, what's the word? So I don't mean regulating it, but how do? How would I know if I had a Picasso? that Jay Newman is in the airport at this time at a free port and he has several gold bars. Like, how would I know who brokers the deal that says, oh, Thane, Jay's here, he's got the gold bars, you have the Picasso, have lunch. So let's just say that the guys, if you own the free port, 
yeah. It would be in your interest to be the honest broker, knowing what all your customers had in their vaults and what they wanted to sell and what they wanted to buy. So, right. So he, he knows what's under the tent that could, and because it, it doesn't have to be simultaneous there, right? It could be, the transaction could take place at a later date. Exactly. Or, right. take, take, you know, it's, uh, you know, just, you know, have a, you know, a just walking down the aisle, you know, Mr. X and Mr. Y decide they're going to, you know, make a deal. You mentioned art, which is um, actually one of the last biggest unregulated markets uh, that there is. Uh, and if you think about the amount of wealth that can be stored in a, in a tube, yeah, you know, just, you know, undoing the Picasso, rolling it up, sticking it in a tube, yeah. uh, you know, putting it under your arm. It doesn't weigh very much. No in fact, there was that movie with Sean Connery where he, he actually mailed it, right? He mailed the tube to, to actually get it out of the country into his castle in Scotland. And if you, even if you, let's just say you went through customs and a customs agent said, I want to see what's in the tube. Does a customs agent know the difference between a, you know, a, uh, a Ken Perenni forgery? Yeah. And, you know, and a Picasso? Yeah. So, so, well, first of all, before I get to the next question, tell the audience, there are hundreds of such places? There are hundreds of them. Uh, <laughs> there, are, there are a couple of, there are a couple of hundred free ports in the U.S., Unbelievable, just really. Well, for mostly legitimate reasons. Yeah, um, no, I understand. Once they're, once they're there, they could be you know, turned to anybody's purposes. So you read, a person reads a novel. This is a guy who spent 40 years on Wall Street. He's a major success. He's a wizard. You, you, I don't even, I don't wanna ask because I'm not interested in knowing like, did you give up the money business to now? I know you've got a three book deal. This is the first of, and by the way, when the movie comes out, uh, I'm not asking for a cameo, but I am asking, <laughs> I have a really great Greta character. The person for Greta is the Russian actress, Olga Korolenko. Do you oh, know who she, she is? She'd be perfect. Perfect. She looks like Greta. Uh, she's got that European look. She's, you know, physically impressive. She's been in those kinds. I'm just throwing that out. When I read the novel, I had her cast. Okay. So, but one, one of the things that's in the book that I think is, is um, at some point you, after 40 years, decided I want to tell a story. So I guess I have to ask you why 40 years into the business tell a story. And then the second question is, do you feel, you know, for, especially in the post-Trump era, where there's already such cynicism about who's watching out for us. This novel introduces a level of cynicism in an entertaining, exciting, you know, lavish way, uh, very enticing, but very cynical about how decisions get made, how politics, how, how leaders get elected. You know, this is so much beyond campaign finance reform. This is so beyond Citizen United, right? Citizens United, you know, the Supreme Court case that said corporations have a First Amendment right to vote too. This is very different. You know, under money is a very different level of dark money that says, well, we don't really know the name of the donor because he, is, he wants to be or she wants to be anonymous. This is to say, we didn't realize that, a, a, that blowing up something uh, an oil rig somewhere or something that some disaster somewhere else that was sort of pushed a little by some, some incredibly devious hedge fund types or military contractors ended up generating the kind of massive wealth that got a Senator elected. I think it's, um, who was it that said, I think it was Lily Tomlin said, no, no matter how cynical I get, I just can't keep up. <laughs> um, uh, no matter how cynical I get, I just can't keep up. But at the same time, I think, didn't you think that there was a, I, I, I think there were, the, 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 the char characters in Undermoney are idealists. Yeah. Optimists. They really, uh, in fact, the- No, you the, said the first word. That's why I, I was very interested that you started off by saying the word patriots. And I thought, wow, what a great way to start the description of the novel. It starts, it has the local hero feel to it. In fact, Senator Ben Korn is a football player from Nebraska, for God's sakes. Yeah. He, has, he has Hollywood handsome features, right? 
I mean, that's who are the core characters. And they're very, these people are, I think, like, like most of us, um, very unhappy with the, the, the dissonance in this country and the, and the fighting. And uh, Ben Korn makes an impassioned speech, basically, you know, saying that he's going to knock everybody's heads together until they act sensibly. And he, he really, he's the, um, I, for me, he's the centrist that, uh, that we've been waiting for. Uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the man who is yet to be um, uh, completely compromised hmm. uh, and wants to do the right thing as they all do. Uh, and yet they're quite realistic about um, how, how bad, how, why, things, why things happen the way they happen. Uh, and the answer to that is often untoward. Right, but then the question then becomes, I think there's a new version of Macbeth that's out now with Denzel Washington, you know, the, the power corrupting absolutely, right? That there is people with the best of intentions, right? Who know what needs to get done and then are given this sort of, you know, or maybe they don't intentionally realize what it is but here, Wall Street is a weapon. You know, we've weaponized the hedge fund industry in this novel and by using it in such a way that could cause massive injuries. It might actually have a good purpose at the end, right? And, you know, we're living through times like this because, you know, there are people who describe January 6th saying, yeah, but but it was for a good cause, right? We're always hearing, yeah, you know, there's all, there's all sorts of people that are saying, yeah, but we can tolerate that because in the end, look what happened. And then there are people who are ethical in, in, and uncompromising in principle and saying, no, we should never sacrifice or compromise the greater good for something that someone later describes as truly the greater good if it causes injury and hardship and, and catastrophe. Exactly, and there's there are a couple of things that are implicit in in what you um, in what you just observed, which are that the the impact of money and power on the brain, huh. uh, and it's something that I've been thinking a lot about the epigenetics of of money. You're uh, saying just to be clear that it, it literally changes you. It changes you. Power changes you, and money changes you. Uh, and there's actually uh, an increasing body of, of not, not just literature, but scientific work uh, that describes these, these uh, phenomena. And this is like what we're at to, to rationalize decisions, right? What's causing all the rationalization is perhaps the money. Yep. Hmm. So speaking of money, before we take some questions from the audience, and we're almost done. This was fun, Jay. You're good at this. Thank you. This was good. <laughs> So when we had Oliver Stone, easy. what's that? You make it easy. Oh, thank you, Jay. So we had Oliver Stone. You'll love this anecdote. There are probably people in the audience today who were in the audience back then. This was during Occupy Wall Street, right? I, we had the chutzpah to invite Oliver Stone while Wall Street was being occupied. I thought this is the perfect time. The, bit, the front page, the business section of the Times covered it. It was perfect, right? So I said to him, I said, Tell us about the greed is the Gordon Gecko greed is good speech. I said, talk a little about that because everyone remembers the greed is remember that's when Gecko is yeah. speaking to the uh, shareholders in front of the officers and the directors and basically saying these all these vice presidents are a bunch of clowns and I know how to turn this I know how to make a profit from this money there's all this hidden value and by the way this is what 1984 1985 this is really in the thick of when Wall Street is hitting its stride as, as a place in the culture and in the popular imagination. So the gecko speech, everyone seems to remember when he says, for lack of another better word, greed is good. And I must say, uh, Stone that night said some interesting things because I, I, I led him this way because I knew this is where he's going. He's going, did you ever actually read the whole speech? And, and he then went on to say, everyone remembers, for lack of a better word, greed is good. But then he basically says what greed does. And he gave a lot of examples that Gecko gives examples of things that it builds, thing that it creates, right? That my self-interests ultimately helps you, right? It's like the classic supply side economics, right? I, what's good for me is actually good for you. So don't, don't see it as greed. But this novel 
takes this in a very different direction because it's greed combined with power, which is, you made me think of it when you said before, you said, what money does, right? It's not just that it buys the yachts, right? It's not just that it gets you invited to the right, the, the Met Gala. It's that it allows you to literally influence events. It's not about just getting your kid into college. It's about something way bigger. And that's not contained in the greed is good speech with Gecko. This is like a 2.0 version of what greed gets you. And, and this is the, the, the complexity of so many people making so much money so quickly over a, you know, it, and it's a phenomenon of the last 20, 30 years. I mean, you talked about, you know, when a million dollars was, you know, was considered to be a lot of money. Now it's, it's, uh, it's a billion dollars, right? And not just, you know, somebody with a billion, but with 400 billion. Uh, and then you have people on without any kind of cultural references, without any sense of history, uh, figuring out how to, you know, how to use their money, where to use their money. Huh. And they're, you know. And, and is that because of excess, Jay? Is because when you have too much, there's a point at which I've already bought everything I really need. And now let's, what else can I do with it? Is it like the ultimate hubris that I already, how many toys can a man or a woman have? F flying, you know, flying to space, you know, it's, it's, um, hmm. you know, it's, it, there's, Yes, I think the short, an the short answer to your question is yes. It's like, what, what more can I do? And what more people can do when they have vast amounts of money is to try to influence events around them. Hmm. Uh, and that I think is one of, the, one of the reasons we're seeing this conflict in this country because we have vast amounts of money that are flowing under the surface that are, it's like the gods are throwing lightning bolts from the sky. Uh, we're living in a, you know, in a, in a Greek era, except the gods are real people that have made scads of money hmm. and are hurling it at each other, trying to get their way. Wow, that is a great novelistic image. And I, I, I really, I want you to stop right there because that is so, that was money. <laughs> and I mean it to a money guy. <laughs> that was a great novelistic image, the, the throwing, the hurling of thunderbolts at each other. Let's take a couple questions and then say goodnight to Jay. This comes from Carolyn H. So she wants to know, she was very obviously intrigued by Freeport. She says, what are the legitimate reasons for Freeports? Well, people, people um, are entitled to, the legitimate reasons are people who want to manufacture things uh, without paying taxes going in and going out and being efficient about how they're making stuff. Uh, legitimate reasons, protecting your property, uh, hmm. uh, is one, if, if you have a, a safe in your wall or in your hotel room, you know, imagine a free port as uh, just a, a massive expansion of that. Um, but, you know, honestly, it's a really good question. <laughs> Another good way to end the night. Uh, before we say goodnight to Jay, I'm just going to, this is, this is a question that answers it for everybody. This came from an anonymous attendee and this is, this is to your credit, Jay, you should hear it, read it in this way. Is this recorded so I can watch it later? And yes, it is, of course. This will live on folks' website forever and you can watch it as many times as you wish. And as Jay's continues to succeed with other books and as people start to really talk about under money as being the, you know, the must read of the season, we'll keep you know, communicating with our audience through social media and say, hey, we had Jay, this is what he said that night. And we'll give you a little clip and you can watch it on Instagram or Facebook or on, on LinkedIn. So yes, you can absolutely watch it. I would say in two days, you can watch it either on our YouTube channel or directly on the website itself. Before we say goodnight to Jay, let's see, do we have any? Well, let me just say that, as you know, we're, we're a nonprofit and we haven't charged during the pandemic. Uh, and so, uh, as you know, there is always a good reason to uh, donate to folks because we are only about one thing, the life of the mind and how to make the life of the mind interesting, witty, entertaining. Uh, we always say, spend an hour with us, you'll walk away entertained and smarter. And I think with, with Jay's help, we absolutely accomplish that. Um, uh, if you're not already on our mailing list, please, uh, go to folks.org and then you'll get uh, updates as to future events. Jay, best of luck to you with the novel. We're rooting for you. So the pub date is Tuesday, right? 
It's Tuesday. Thank you All again. Right. Thank you very much. Jay, we're, we're rooting for you. This is a wonderful read. Uh, it's something for book clubs. It's something for people that love thrillers. And I think what it does, it does thrillers. I said at the beginning that it's a, a thriller for the mind. You know, it's a, it's a deep read uh, in, in, in an enormously entertaining way with incredible cultural references. Uh, and you'll learn stuff that you could not have possibly known before. You got a true insider's look uh, at something called Under Money. So uh, for the end of saying goodnight to Jay and for saying goodnight to the audience until next time at Folks, I'm Thane Rosenbaum. Good night, thank you.